Okay, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. I'm here to welcome you to this event. Um, the SOAS South Asia Institute hosts a series of book launches, lectures, and other events on a regular basis. And this evening, it really gives me some pleasure to welcome Gahapal Singh back to SOAS to launch the book that he's authored with Giorgio Shani on Sikh nationalism. Uh, Gah Gahapal has been many things in his career, but he was also a kind, he was kind and nurturing uh, as a dean of faculty to me, so I'm personally indebted to him. And I've actually just said that on a recorded live web seminar, so it's there for posterity now. So thank you very much, Gurhapal. Um, Gurhapal is also the Emeritus, Emeritus Professor of Sikh and Punjab Studies at SOAS. Um, and his previous major publications have included The Partition of India, Sikhs in Britain, and Ethnic Conflict in India. Sikh Nationalism, the book we're here to launch today, was co-authored with Giorgio Shani, who is Professor and Chair in the Department of Politics, International Studies at the International Christian University in Tokyo. And Giorgio is currently in Tokyo, so if you can imagine the time difference, so I'm really grateful for you taking the time to be here with us. He's the author of Religion, Identity and Human Security and Sikh Nationalism and Identity in a Global Age. We're joined also by two discussants this evening, Professor Ian Talbot and my colleague, uh, so as Professor Peter Flugel. And the way we're going to run it this evening is that Gahapo and Giorgio will introduce the book, and then we will have commentary from Ian and Peter, followed by uh, a Q&A session. So welcome all, welcome to panelists, authors, and to our online audience. Uh, I apologize that we had to move online um, rather than to hold this event in person. It would have been nice, but such are circumstances. So, Gahapal, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I want to begin by thanking colleagues uh, within the South Asia Institute for organizing this event, and also to Peter and Ian for their time and effort, and Giorgio for staying up so late. I should add that I tried very hard to get a gender equal panel of discussants, but because of the previous commitments of the colleagues I approach, um, this was not possible. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to say that I've been working around or on the subject for nearly four decades, uh, from the time I began as a research student at the LSE in the early 80s. In 2009, I organized a conference on Sikh nationalism at the University of Birmingham, where most of the leading specialists on the subject in the world attended. Papers presented at the conference were never published because soon afterwards I moved to SOAS and the task was put on the back burner. Fortunately, it was revived again when the CUP approached me for a volume but given my responsibilities then at SOAS, uh, I approached Giorgio to collaborate with me on this project. The timing of the publication is purely coincidental. It comes in the year which marks the 75th anniversaries of partition, India's and Pakistan's independence, and a Hindu nationalist government in India, which is seeking to redefine the post-1947 order. And to this to say nothing of the chilling developments in the Ukraine over the last week. So the context is timely. It's timely enough to reflect on what the late professor Anthony D. Smith, the great student of nationalism, 
at the LSC called the nationalisms of small peoples. That is nationalism in South Asia, nationalisms in South Asia that were marginalized in 1947 in the hastily transfer of power to India and Pakistan. Our objective in writing this work were threefold to provide an accessible text for students, scholars and the general reader, to locate the Sikh case within the comparative literature on ethnicity, nations and nationalisms, and to start a debate about the need to study Sikh nationalism seriously. The book addresses the following key questions. Are the Sikhs a nation? If so, what kind of nation? And how does the politics of Sikh nationhood play out in the modern period in South Asia and the diaspora? Interestingly, such questions were central to those working on the Sikhs in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. The work of Krishwant Singh, Joyce Pettigrew and Paul Brass and the latter's seminal volume, Language, Religion and Politics in North India are some of the leading examples. Yet since, the ninth, yet since 1984, perhaps reflecting the decade of turmoil that followed the development of Sikh studies um, and the development of Sikh studies as an essentially religious subject, debates about Sikh identity have displaced concerns about nationhood. Sikh identity issues are extraordinarily complex and they are, of course, not without their normative agendas. For example, who is a Sikh? Who is doing the defining? And how do Sikhs themselves articulate their subjectivities? These things are discussed in some detail in the book, but to keep things simple and clear, the volume uses the two main narratives of modern Sikh identity of religion and a nation. To these, it adds a third, the narrative of Sikhs as a minority, both in the Punjab, in India, and in the diaspora. We then explore how these narratives of as a religion, as a nation, as a minority, coalesce and diverge, and how they are shaped um, at the politics of Sikh formations since the end of the 19th century. Uh, I should point out that unlike the study of nationalisms of major traditions, minority nationalisms, especially of complex minorities like the Sikhs, present special challenges. As a result, we have used, and Giorgio will highlight this, an integrated approach to bring together four complementary approaches. Our main debt, as I pointed out earlier, is to Professor Anthony Smith, and his ethno-symbolic approach, which emphasizes the power of nationalism as being rooted in the myths and memories of a community and the ability to interpret them. That is to quote him, the way in which a popular sense of a living past has been and can be rediscovered and reinterpreted by nationalists and nationalist intelligentsia. Um, again, I will not say much and save time because I know Giorgio is going to do a presentation where he focuses mostly on these methodological issues, um, except to say that the Sikhs are a highly symbolic community. They have a myth of election as chosen people, as embodied in the idea of the Khalsa, a history of persecution and a legacy of statehood, indeed an empire in the 19th century. So in addition to these approaches, uh, we had three other, we draw on three other approaches. Firstly, the literature on minorities and minority nationalisms um, and, and how minorities outlook is shaped by the world around them. Here our concern is to outline the efforts of, of the Muslim League and the Congress in the Punjab before 1947 and the Congress after 1947. Um, to, uh, nation building and how this has shaped Sikh minority consciousness. We also add the consciousness of being a 
uh, we also add that the consciousness of being a distinct and vulnerable minority has been reinforced by the politics of the diaspora. Secondly, we view the Sikh diaspora from its inception in the late 19th century as an integral part of the development of Sikh nationalism. The diaspora is not an independent actor as much of the existing literature emphasizes. Rather, the diaspora and the Sikhs in the Punjab are mutually dependent, sometimes more, sometimes less, but never completely independent or autonomous. Third, the work draws on the literature on religious nationalism. And Georgia will say, as I said, a bit more on this. And we highlight the literature since, uh, on religious nationalism since the late 90s, 9-11, and in particular, um, we draw on it to redraw, uh, rethink the relationship between Congress secular nationalism and Hindu nationalism and how um, Sikh nationalism and religion are distinct um, from these two um, trends. So I'm conscious of the time um, I will move on to some of the main con conclusions, which I think are important um, for those interested in finding out more about the work. So the first one is that against the prevailing consensus in Sikh studies, um, the view that religion is a main narrative of Sikh identity, we argue with substantial evidence that the narrative of a nation and as a minority are also important in the modern period. The latter two are not contradictory, but complementary, and they have been highly influential in shaping the politics of modern Sikh formations in the homeland and the diaspora. Second, it is possible to sketch a linear process of ethnogenesis um, among the Sikhs from a small community in the middle of the 15th century, um, a small religious community, I should add, from the middle of the 15th century to a distinctive ethnic group and the consciousness of a nation, albeit a nation without a state. This process also works in reverse. Thus in the 18th century, despite the Sikhs acquiring state power, Sikhism reverted to the normative order of Punjabi Hindu society. Since 1947, the recognition by the Indian constitution of Sikhs as only a religious community has greatly diminished Sikhs' claims to nationhood. Third, Sikh nationalism is identity driven. It has a strong territorial commitment to the Punjab, but can also accommodate deterritorial imaginings of the nation. The religious ethic of openness to the other to not to dominate or be dominated enables Sikh nationalism to readily accommodate religious pluralism and multiculturalism. The political colonial ideal of Sikh leadership before 1947 was a religiously plural Punjab in which neither the Hindus nor Muslims had a majority. A separate Sikh state was an option of last resort the necessary logic of a subcontinent divided by religious nationalism. Whether in the 1940s or in the 1980s and 90s, mainstream Sikh leadership has been reluctant separatist. Fourth, Sikh nationalism is best viewed as a continuum with multiculturalism at the one end and, separate, and a separate state at the other. In the book, there is a table which um, highlights this. The vast space in between is occupied by the Congress and the other parties and the Akali Dal with its non Prasai resolution of 1973, which harks back to the cabinet mission plan of 1947 and seeks to limit the power of the center to defense, currency, communications and foreign affairs. Fifthly, the volume called for a critical appraisal of the common distinction between um, Congress's secular nationalism and the BJP's ethnic Hindu nationalism. Today in India, there is a lively debate between the two. Rahul Gandhi has recently spoken of India as a union of states, while his grandmother was adamant that India was a multicultural union, a construction 
not too dissimilar from the BJP's ethnic nationalism um, with diversity, but defined by an overarching identity of religion. While the BJP's claim to the naturalness of its nationhood are being contested, we should not overlook the fact that secular and territorial nationalism of the Congress is in no small measure a retrospective reconstruction in which state power played a substantial role. The Sikh case and how it's been managed by the Indian state, as I pointed out in the early 1990s, suggests that India should be coded as an ethnic democracy. This is further reinforced by the common experience of India's peripheral regions in the Northwest and Northeast. So finally, comparatively, I just highlight that the work um, demonstrates that complex minorities like the Sikhs, often compared to the Jews, can be read within the literature on ethnicity, nations and nationalism. That Sikhs as a minority in the Punjab in the diaspora have pioneered, valued and adapted to multiculturalism, consociationism, that is power sharing and religiously plural polit polities. And that the Sikh case is an example of nation of a nation without a state that might thrive in conditions of post sovereignty. Alternatively, as a result of nation breaking and overt religious assimilation, it might experience a rapid decline in nation nas. In short, in conclusion, I would say the volume draws attention to the challenges, dilemmas, and problems of studying the nationalism of minorities, or indeed the nationalism of small peoples. The volume ends with a plea to take the study of Sikh nationalism more seriously. Thank you. Good Harpo. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic introduction to the book and a great kickoff for an evening of discussion. So next up, we have Giorgio Shani, who is going to deliver a pre-recorded um, presentation, pre-recorded because it's, it's now uh, 20 past two in, in Japan. So Sunil, if you could press play, that would be fantastic. Hello, it's a great honor uh, to be able to present uh, at SOAS. Um, I did my on Sikh nationalism over two decades ago, um, and it's a great honor uh, to be invited back to talk about uh, the book with Gohapal on Sikh nationalism published by Cambridge University Press. Um, unfortunately, uh, I cannot be with you today because uh, I'm in uh, Japan. Um, however, uh, I have uh, uh, some comments to make about the book and uh, I would like to share uh, in the, uh, for the sake of, of brevity, uh, some PowerPoint slides, which I hope you can see. Um, so I should uh, point out first that um, uh, this book is a mutual collaboration between Gahapa and myself. Um, I was primarily responsible for the theoretical framework in chapter one and the chapter in the diaspora on chapter eight. So I'll speak specifically uh, to, those, uh, to those chapters. Uh, the book begins by exploring different narratives of Sikh identity. Um, and we isolate uh, three narratives. Um, the first narrative is Sikhism as a world religion or a pump. Uh, this is the dominant or hegemonic narrative uh, within uh, academia. So Sikhs are seen as followers of Guru Nanak with the sacred script, the Guru Granth Sahib, and institutions, the Khalsa and um, Arimandir Sahib and the Akal Takht in the Golden Temple uh, complex. Um, the second narrative, which is the narrative we focus on, looks at Sikhs as a nation or a calm. So Sikhs are seen as a people. We share a common language, Punjabi, a territorial homeland, the Punjab, and a political system centered on the uh, SGPC, Shiramani Akali Dal complex. Now, uh, the important point to note is that both of these narratives emerged out of the colonial encounter. However, um, they cannot be seen mainly, mainly as derivative discourses of colonialism. 
this is the starting our starting point. Um, and so our focus is very much on the second narrative, Sikhs as a nation or, or a Khan. And I think uh, we should also point out um, that um, uh, the work which has been done on both of these narratives uh, within Sikh studies, uh, where still Sikhism as world religion is seen as the hegemonic narrative. Now to this within the book, we add a third narrative, Sikhs as a minority or a diaspora. So Sikhs are seen as a religious minority in India and an ethnic minority in the West where narratives of diaspora are strong. And one of the strengths of the book is uh, in um, its integrative approach, uh, which looks at uh, relations uh, between homeland and the diaspora um, as mutually dependent. Um, rather than looking at uh, diaspora nationalism as an independent variable. Okay, um, now the following table, uh, table 1.1 in the book, looks at the literature on Sikh ethnicity and nationalism. And we can distinguish between primordial instrumentalist, modernist, uh, post-colonial diaspora and religious nationalist approaches. However, the main focus of our approach is ethno, ethno symbolism, uh, which focuses on the ethnic dimensions of nationalism. Uh, nations is based on uh, what Anthony Smith termed an ethne. Um, so this forms uh, the starting point uh, of the book, although um, uh, I'm personally uh, associated and influenced by post colonialism and views of nationalism as a derivative the discourse. Um, however, um, uh, part of the problems of, of post-colonialism is that it is unable to account uh, for um, the cosmological tradition of Sikhi. Um, it, can, it mainly focuses on the transformations of Sikh identity after colonialism. Uh, and uh, our focus very much is on how this tradition uh, and this narrative of Sikhs as a nation came about. So if we look at uh, uh, Sikh nationalism, the focus is very much on the indent dimension of Sikh subjectivity uh, following the work of Smith. It takes an ethno-symbolist approach, which emphasizes the role of religious myths and historical memories in the nationalist imaginary. So uh, this can be counterposed to modernist approaches to nationalism which focus on elite manipulation or on roles of elites and the state in the construction of nationalist identities or the role of print capitalism, if we look at the work of Benedict Anderson. Um, our starting point is to look at the nation as a sacred communion of people devoted to the unity and identity in a historic homeland, to quote Smith. And by this criteria, of nationalism. So this conception of nationalism can be applied to the Sikhs. The book examines the transformation of Sikh subjectivity in the colonial period and the legacy of partition. And as I mentioned earlier, integrates the study of Sikh nationalism in the Punjab with that of the diaspora. Finally, it offers new insights into religious and minority nationalisms in a globalizing world. And this will be um, the uh, the, the final um, slide, which I'll look at, um, looks at the possibilities uh, which globalization um, uh, has for uh, understanding Sikh identity. Uh, so in the book, I um, uh, look at the possibility of the, con or ask a provocative question, whether Sikhism uh, can be seen or whether um, we are the impact of globalization on uh, Sikh identities uh, may lead to uh, the formation of a new form of imagined community, a global Sikh calm. And this is based on an understanding of Sikh na nationhood as embodied uh, in the external symbols uh, of the Khalsa primarily, rather than as uh, rooted in, in territory. So it's embodied nationalism 
rather than territorial nationalism. Consequently, uh, I argue that Sikhs are a sovereign people irrespective of statehood in India and the diaspora. Um, therefore, the Khalsa Pant corresponds to a deterritorialized calm or community which may be suited to a global age. This is the main thesis I advanced in my, my former work, Sikh Nationalism and Identity in a Global Age. Now, uh, this book, the starting point in a way of this book is uh, in a way to bring back in uh, understandings of uh, the territorial dimension of Sikh nationalism. So perhaps in retrospect, I overstated the impact on globalization on territorialized identities. And as a result of COVID um, and uh, the slowing down of, of the world economy and travel restrictions, uh, which prevent me from coming from Japan uh, to attend this uh, book launch uh, in person, uh, we may be looking at um, a world after globalization. Uh, and what will this world look like? Will there be a return to ethno-nationalism? Will there be a, a return to territorial nationalisms, uh, the like of which we, is being played out at the moment uh, in the conflict uh, in, in the Ukraine? Um, and it's also important to note that as in the conflict of Ukraine, uh, there is a religious dimension uh, to, uh, uh, to, to this nationalism. So territorial nationalisms are infused uh, with religious nationalism. Um, so uh, this book, in a way, um, seeks to, to, to bring back in the territorial dimensions uh, to Sikh identity and to focus on uh, this narrative of, of Sikhism as a nation, because we argue that uh, this understanding of Sikhism as a nation accords with the self-understanding of many Sikhs in the world today. Thank you very much. Um, Georgia, thank you very much. That was really provocative and wonderful. So we've heard from our authors, and between them, they've clearly shown the, the value of academic collaboration uh, as both of their interests and approaches are brought together in one volume. Um, it also occurred to me while you were both speaking to comment very briefly on the fact that I hope this book is used for teaching because such a clear exegesis of theories of nationalism and how they apply to one particular context in the way that you laid it out in that presentation uh, is very valuable indeed. So now we're fortunate enough to have two discussants, so I'm just going to take the liberty to introduce rather more fully than I did before. Um, the first is Professor Ian Talbot, who is Emeritus Professor in History of Modern South Asia at the University of Southampton. Um, Ian has published a great deal uh, over the course of his long and successful career, but most recently a book um, called A Modern History of South Asia, which was published by Yale in 2016. So Ian, please. Thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, to the South Asia Institute uh, for inviting me to make this presentation relating to the book. I think we've already heard from the uh, authors uh, that some of the themes, and also I think um, people will have got a taste of both the empirical richness, but also the theoretical sophistication, uh, which underpins uh, this volume. And, and the final uh, point, which we've just heard, which I think is also a, a key element when you get to read it, if you haven't read it, is the accessibility of the volume. It's those three elements, I think, which are so impressive uh, in dealing with the complexities uh, of uh, Sikh nationalism. I've known, of course, both authors over many years and, and, and have been um, privy to some of the thinking, some of the earlier research, uh, the theorizing that's gone into to making this. Um, study and I think that it's something which uh, as we've heard is really enhanced by um, the ability to bring different 
uh, frameworks and integrate them into this study uh, of uh, Sikh nationalism. And the other introductory point I want to make is obviously, yes, this is a very timely study uh, in terms of uh, both the coming 75th anniversary of partition and one of the themes of the, the volume is the, uh, the legacy of partition for Sikh nationalism. Uh, also, of course, the rise of um, religious nationalism within South Asia and, and the questions which this may pose uh, for uh, Sikh national identity going forward and how it's expressed uh, as well. What I want to do is, is to really uh, reflect in three uh, different literatures which I've been engaged with over my career uh, and how the volume intersects uh, with these literatures. Literatures of um, partition studies, uh, of uh, Pakistan studies and also a Punjab studies, uh, because I think this volume uh, is an important intervention uh, in some of these literatures. And it also, in a sense, perhaps interrogates some existing understandings and also reinforces uh, some existing understandings. I'm gonna start first with uh, partition studies uh, because of the timely nature uh, of, of the volume. And the fact that um, it actually reflects uh, on a number of key issues uh, relating to the wider um, partition and departure of the British from India. Uh, one of the things which comes out very clearly, which we've already heard uh, from the, the authors, is the fact that uh, the Sikhs um, were to some extent uh, pushed to one side uh, as a, a group uh, by the need for an all India settlement uh, between Congress uh, and between the British uh, and obviously also the court between the Muslim League's demand for a separate state of Pakistan. Uh, so this is um, the context in which um, the Sikh pol political leadership has to operate. And much of the writing about the Sikh political leadership in partition studies is very much around uh, perhaps personal failings or weaknesses of that leadership. And yet uh, what this volume does is it very much shows how um, the Sikh leadership was hemmed in uh, by these external pressures uh, that, that were coming to bear uh, in, in 1947. And that's why perhaps different strategies uh, were adopted, which may give the impression of uh, incoherence and ad hocism, moving from um, more consociational um, approaches to the post-British uh, settlement to uh, raising uh, a demand for a Sikhistan or a Khalistan state. So that was always very much um, the last um, resort in some senses for the Sikhs after they'd exhausted earlier um, proposals which were put to one side uh, in this desire for an all India settlement. And of course, they're similar in some respects to other small uh, people's nationalisms uh, in this end game of empire, like the Pashtuns, uh, for example, um, to, a, to a lesser extent, uh, obviously like um, the Tamils, but also um, what was going to transpire in Northeast India. So that an all India settlement uh, is to the detriment uh, of, of these um, sort of uh, small national uh, movements. But at the same time, the fact that the Sikhs do raise these variety of proposals indicates that there were alternative possibilities. And one of the problems with partition studies is sometimes to see uh, everything is predetermined and there were not alternatives, uh, regional arrangements that could have happened uh, that might have been an alternative to the um, final settlement that was agreed between the leaders of the, uh, the Muslim League Congress uh, and the British, although um, with varying degrees of 
uh, reluctance as far as that is concerned. Also, the, the, the volume touches on the issue, which again is a feature in partition studies of violence and the circumstances of violence and the, the role of the Sikhs in this. Uh, and it um, draws on the literature uh, and also reinforces the existing literature, showing that um, violence was not just spontaneous or a temporary madness, it was very much with a political purpose for the Sikhs, just as violence was used by all communities um, for a political purpose uh, in uh, 1947. And that, uh, in a sense, um, it's almost, I think the authors say, predictable uh, that the Sikhs would perhaps use violence in East Punjab uh, to drive out the Muslims, having failed to get uh, a settlement that would safeguard uh, their community interests. So you can see here that uh, there are significant areas and partition studies that um, this volume um, adds to, and that um, it brings out the complexities, both of um, outcomes, it brings out um, the overriding um, all India settlement, pushing aside regional interests, it uh, adds understanding to uh, what caused the violence. There's also, I think, the, um, the issue um, moving on to um, the field of Pakistan studies that this uh, volume adds to as well. Within Pakistan studies, as I've said, um, there is a, a view that uh, the Sikhs were badly let down by their political leaders in 1947, and they could have jumped at another way uh, in which would have safeguarded their interests. But the volume shows that um, this wasn't necessarily um, an easy thing for them to throw their lot in uh, with Pakistan, given their historical memories um, going back uh, to um, the Mughal period. Uh, and also given the fact that um, contemporary violence as in the Ralpindi massacres uh, in uh, March, 1947, uh, created uh, circumstances in which um, for many Sikhs, they could not um, conceive of living uh, in a Muslim dominated Punjab within a Muslim dominated Pakistan. Whatever uh, assurances Jinnah might have given uh, to minorities. Um, also, I think as far as Pakistan studies is concerned, uh, there's not just this issue of uh, the failure of um, Sikh political leadership in um, 1947, but also there is a very much um, a view of um, Sikh identity, Sikh nationalism as just religious nationalism. Uh, and this volume, of course, shows that this is one component, perhaps, of understanding um, Sikh nationalism and, and that of course is um, not just there in academic studies uh, of uh, the Sikh community uh, but is also there perhaps in the way the Pakistan state has treated um, uh, Sikh community um, since 1947 in India uh, in s lurching in a sense from um, support of religious nationalism up to a point in the Khalistan movement through to the contemporary religious tourism uh, elements of the Pakistan state's attitude to the Sikhs uh, and of course the whole issue of the Kartapur corridor which indeed is referred to uh, at, at uh, the end of, of the volume. So how Pakistan studies, how the Pakistan state understands Sikhs is really very important, uh, both for that community and also um, more widely uh, within the, the South Asian context. And this volume, I think, um, begins to open up uh, some of these uh, issues relating to um, Pakistan uh, and, and the Sikh community, uh, which are very much a contemporary feature uh, now in terms of uh, the state reaching out, Imran Khan's uh, government reaching out uh, to the Sikh community. However, and this is 
a link with Punjab studies, the last area I'm going to mention. Um, the um, issue of the Kartapur corridor perhaps needs to be looked at in a longer term historical context. And this is the, um, the work which was published almost simultaneously with this volume uh, by uh, Ilias Chatter, again uh, by Cambridge University Press, on, on the Punjab borderland. It, it's very interesting and indeed um, quite illuminating in that um, that area uh, around um, sort of Dera Baba Nanak uh, was always um, quite an open border um, in the Punjab borderland, uh, Ilias Chata shows that uh, there wasn't uh, an iron curtain coming down uh, in 1947. The, the border was porous, people were moving back and forth, uh, the illicit trade he talks about, but he also says that the roots of illicit trade were later used by the, um, the authorities in Pakistan uh, to um, move um, weapons and, and to enable Sikh militancy. Uh, in the 1980s. So this is an area which is um, perhaps got a history to it, um, which may help to explain to an extent um, some of the uh, attitudes within uh, Indian security thinking as far as the Kartapur corridor was concerned. They were far less enthusiastic perhaps than Imran Khan was, though Imran Khan himself uh, was acting not independently uh, of the, the military establishment uh, within Pakistan in terms of uh, the whole Kartapur corridor uh, sort of initiative. So then these three literatures um, intersect uh, Punjab studies, partition studies, Pakistan studies, with some of the key themes uh, of this um, volume. And, uh, and they also open up perhaps um, areas that could be considered for future research agendas. Uh, and one area which, which is, I think, uh, an interesting one, and it, it, it links into um, certainly the reluctance uh, of, of this, the Sikhs to, um, be in the Pakistan state is not just the experiences of violence in Punjab itself, but the issues within the Northwest Frontier province. And one of the things which I think is quite important in uh, contemporary Pakistani writing on um, Sikhs is that usually Sikhs are always looked at uh, from a Punjab prism. Um, to reach out to um, India, to uh, perhaps uh, destabilize India. Uh, it, it's a Punjab-centric understanding. Uh, the reality is, I think, that there's probably more Sikhs uh, in Pakistan who are Sindhi or Pashtun in ethnicity uh, than Punjabi. Uh, and that element uh, isn't actually there. Uh, in, in the literature. And indeed, of course, uh, that element um, is, is used sometimes uh, within Pakistan understanding that um, the Sikhs are at home uh, in Pakistan because they're at home in the Punjab cultural area. Uh, actually, the, the experience of Sikhs uh, in uh, KP or in Sindh uh, might be very different to the experience of Sikhs uh, in, in, in Punjab. And uh, that is, I think, an area for exploration uh, as well. Um, I'm going to finish on that point, uh, though that there are all kinds of avenues that one could go down uh, in terms of uh, how the work could be taken on further. Thank you. Ian, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, before I introduce the next discussant, I just encourage um, the audience to begin to think of questions, which I will moderate through the Q&A function on our webinar software. Um, so please write them there. 
The final discussant for the evening is uh, Professor Peter Flugel. Peter is Professor in the Study of Religions and Philosophies at SOAS, and he's also Chair of the Centre for Jaina Studies, which is a very influential uh, and important part of our institution. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honour to be invited uh, to, to say a few words about this new book, uh, which I had uh, a chance to read uh, very quickly um, only. I'm not a specialist, obviously, in Sikh studies. So you may ask, uh, why am I, what can I contribute to this debate? However, um, Jaina studies has a lot in common um, with Sikh studies, not least as far as the position uh, of the two uh, communities in India is concerned as so-called minorities. And uh, uh, I will say something about the comparison between the two communities and their situation in uh, India and maybe globally at the end. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to praise the work um, for its erudition. I learned quite a lot and uh, also for its uh, integral point of view. It is not a, a work that takes sides. It tries to present a, a unified pers perspective and summarize the various academic perceptions uh, and, and views and arguments in a, in a very objective way. And in that sense, it's, it's truly a, a classical teaching resource and anyone who has an interest in the uh, history of um, modern uh, Sikh community uh, is uh, advised to have a, a close look at this work. Um, for those uh, who are not uh, familiar with the book, I think it may be useful to quickly summarize what it's all about. I, uh, I think uh, uh, can I share the uh, the screen, uh, Ed? Is that possible? Sunil, could you give Peter the screen sharing? Right, please. Otherwise, I talk too long, and it's easier just to show uh, um, our attendees a simple picture, i.e., the list of contents. I assume most of the uh, of the. You can share it. Okay, excellent. So. That saves me a lot of words. And those of you who have not seen the book uh, can get a clear idea what it's all about. Um, what I want to point out here is that um, most of the book is really dedicated to the post 47 um, period of uh, the Sikh history. And it's uh, where is it located in? terms of scholarship, it says the two questions in particular um, perturbed the, the writers. Uh, one I noted here is uh, the difficulty, the main difficulty they write, which confronts researchers in addressing the subject uh, from uh, uh, the perspective, perspective taken is how to define the Sikh sociologically. And, uh, um, there is a lot of sociological information in the text. However, it is uh, not really a sociological study. It is, uh, in my view, a study located in political science. And uh, the, the core substantial chapters, they all deal with uh, the intricacies of, uh, as you can see, the emergence of Sikh, modern Sikh nationalism, Partition of India, as we heard, uh, Indian Union and the Six uh, before and after Blue Star. And really, it comes to its own in, in the period from the Blue Star uh, um, crisis onwards and uh, gives a, a very good idea where Sikh, the Sikh community stands now in terms of its political identity. Um, what is new in the book, as far as I can see, and I'm not 
very well read in, in the field uh, of seek studies. And I can say I'm, I'm totally neutral, of course, this is the beauty of having me here, um, is that uh, it gives a, it offers a historical dimension in addition to Paul Brass uh, study of Sikh nationalism. I mean, the, the notion of Sikh nationalism has been introduced before, and that is all well uh, described in the volume, which really essential teaching resource, as I, uh, as I said. And it adds a historical dimension, particularly in chapter two, uh, Sikhism and the Sikhs up to the 1890s. I mean, without it, it you can say it perfectly fits into um, the Paul Brass uh, frame, but uh, it adds a historical dimension to it. And in, in contrast to Brass, it advocates for the theory of nationalism of Anthony Smith, the ethno-nationalism, whereas uh, Paul Brass has a modernist notion of nationalism, basically of founded on the uh, European model of say uh, the French revolutionary idea of what a nation uh, looks like. Um, beyond that, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ideas as far as I can see. For me, it was most instructive to see how uh, the, the work uh, uh, highlighted on, on two topics really. One is, uh, the relationship between um, uh, the Sikhs and the Congress party. And the other is uh, how to deal uh, with the, the Khalsa, the Tat Khalsa movement. And uh, the, the phrase that stuck into my mind is um, fairly uh, at the end of the book by Guharpal Singh. Um, where he talks about the strange death of ethno-nationalism. And with that, he, he indica indicates, or he points to the Tat Khalsa um, uh, desire to establish a, a Sikh state. And this seems to have completely moved into the background. Um, I've also stumbled across an article by uh, Mr. Kumar in the, uh, a PEW uh, from 2004 already stated something like it. And uh, if I may cite another um, passage, uh, fairly at the end, it says the central argument of this book is that militant Sikh nationalism has to be placed within the framework of how the Indian state managed ethnic conflict in the Punjab after 1947 exogenous factors, Pakistan and the diaspora, accentuated the pre-existing pre -existing tensions over center state relationships. And then the uh, political divisions uh, are analyzed within the uh, Sikh uh, community. And it is pointed out that uh, nowadays uh, we are living in a, in a post ethno-nationalist period and ethno-nationalism seems to be identified with the Tat Khalsa uh, movement and uh, um, as adopted by militant uh, Sikhs. Um, now, what about ethno-nationalism? It seems like a contradiction in terms, obviously, and both Smith and the authors of the volume basically treat ethnicity and nationalism almost identical as identical terms, as synony synonymous terms. And I ask myself what, what these terms actually add to our sociological understanding analytically. I mean, given that, I mean, there, there is this wonderful uh, work here, what does the, the label ethno-nationalism actually add to it? Um, and uh, I looked at Max Weber again, where Anthony Smith more or less got his definition from. He cut out the element of interbreeding, which, uh, which Weber also had in his definition of ethnicity, of, or F, the ethne. He had no definition of ethnicity as such. And uh, 
um, there is uh, um, in uh, th th there's just uh, what Max Weber. That's what I wanted to say. Is that the closer you look at it, um, the more evaporates. Uh, if, uh, vague becomes the concept. The concept of ethnic group dissolves if we define our terms closely. Like the concept of the nation, it is very, very vague. And maybe that's uh, what actually the nature of nationalism is. It's just an ideological reference point that serves to unify people, whatever the ideolo ideology is or combination of ideologies. It may be religion, it may be some political idea, uh, communism, Marxism, whatever it is, uh, or, uh, or end or territorial uh, conception that is very, very vague. And if you look at the definition of uh, Anthony Smith of an ethnic group, it has a name, it has a, some historical myths or uh, historical memories that are you know, ritualized, recited, common, some common culture, a territory, and a sense of solidarity. Um, you can apply this to any group uh, at all times. So uh, it's, uh, um, that, is, that is one point. The other point uh, is something which I was missing in looking at the bibliography and the text and that is a reference and discussion of um, Louis de Mont's seminal article, Nationalism and Communalism in 19, 1964, where he uh, addresses all these, uh, these issues. And according to his work, of course, the Sikhs, like other religious uh, groups in, in uh, or groups that refer to religion as an identifi identifier, um, fall under the label of communalism. Now, the, the study avoids, the, is very keen to avoid the term communalism because it has a critical analysis of the role of the Congress during uh, the time after a partition and uh, whatever lo the local politics were. Um, of course, Sikhs were always also members of the Congress. Maybe there was a non-Sikh majority, but the many Sikhs, of course, non-Sikhs, of course, living in the Punjab as well. So, um, the communalism, the term was used by the Congress, so the argument goes, um, to deny the Sikhs uh, its own nation, uh, but put them somehow, incorporate them within the Indian state on a, on a lower level sort of a local uh, second order nations, if one wants to use that term. And if one looks at Dumont, he basically says, um, communalism is the affirmation of the religious community as a political group. Exactly this is the argument of this text. Um, but he adds, um, it is therefore, it has a hybrid character. It has both a religious and a political dimension, and that is intrinsically uh, contradictory and, and leads to all sorts of um, um, problems, internal contradictions. And uh, he says, religion is not taken as the essence and guide of life in all spheres, but only as a sign of distinction of one human, at least virtually, political group against others. And then he points out that a key feature of nationalism and communalism is the focus on the individual rather than on some, some group. And my question to the, the authors would be, um, to what extent uh, uh, individualism uh, is a factor that may have played a role uh, uh, an ideological role in the formation of all these uh, new types of groupings or interpretations of of religion as a um, as a, a social formation played a role. I.e., uh, the, the nation as an individual 
amongst other nations as a quasi, as a political body. Uh, and of course, the individual uh, versus caste and other traditional uh, um, identities, uh, which have not vanished, of course. Um, okay, that, that's uh, this. And uh, now coming to the Jains, I mean, I could say more about this, but uh, I don't want to uh, linger on, coming to the Jains and maybe the Buddhists. I mean, for millennia, there was talk about uh, uh, problems uh, or, or the, how, how did people identify themselves within these religious traditions? Um, the famous formula of the Buddhists is Buddha Dharma Sangha. So there's, you know, there's a founding figure, uh, then the teaching, and then there's the community. And uh, I mean, the, the term kom, it, one can say, read as a as synonym of sangha or of uh, as much as, uh, well, I leave out the old pant kom uh, issue and uh, the question of ideology and, and, uh, and political movement or uh, social movement. And what, what is different? I mean, according to the ethno-symbolic approach um, applied here, there are basically five criteria which have been used in the narratives of those who created this ethno, ethnic or nationalist uh, interpretation and formation of the Sikh community whatever a community is, of course, is another of these vague sociological or proto-sociological terms. A text, uh, I mean, guru, text, i.e. teaching, pant, i.e. community, you know, uh, Buddha Dharma Sangha, same thing. What else is there? The history of martyrdom that is celebrated, of course, in the Golden Temple, for instance, I've seen that impressive exhibition, uh, which no one <laughs> has ever been there, will ever forget. And then the focus on the territory, closely linked with memory of the Sikh, uh, the kingdom uh, or the rule of the King uh, Ranjit Singh, uh, who happened to be a Sikh. And, uh, uh, principalities and the Sikh rulers. And uh, so what, what, uh, what to make of it? The Jains, they don't have an, um, any claim to territory that distinguishes them. They share uh, all the criteria. They have a history of uh, martyrdom, but they don't have a history of political martyrdom. They have never been targeted as a group. Um, there was in the 19th century, a Jain communal, a communalist, if you may <laughs> wish, uh, movement, uh, which had no effect. There were a few intellectuals who promoted it. They said, um, it is really not uh, very useful that we have uh, endogamy and people within the Sikh community uh, only marry within their own caste. So we want to create a unified, at least on the lay level, uh, community also to strengthen our position vis-a-vis -vis the various states in which we are located. So in the UK, you have uh, now uh, some kind of Jain organization which presents Jain unity vis-a-vis -vis the state as in India. Um, but it didn't really work. This is a project of a few intellectuals and um, as a political force, the Jains uh, did not really figure. Um, their legal position is the same as, as for the Sikhs. Um, I don't think they have been, however, in the UK recognized as an ethnic group. I think this is a very peculiarity of the, the British so-called Race Relations Act. Um, for a German, it sounds very weird, the Race Relations Act. And if you look at the details, 
of course, the role of religion there, etc., is all very, very uh, peculiar. And to refer to the British legal definition of an ethnic group, which also plays a role in this uh, text, is uh, um, not sociological, it is legal. Um, so uh, I think I close with this and just um, point to the fact that the Jane case is very similar, um, but uh, they, I think they benefited from historically from their weak political weakness as a religious, basically religious community divided in so many subsects, obscures, um, castes, et cetera, that in something like Jane studies actually makes sense. And um, um, what they have maintained, and I believe the Sikhs must have maintained as well, that is a, a clear distinction between religion and society. And uh, therefore the ability to criticize social formations from an idealistic, if you like, uh, religious point of view, the point of view of, a, of an ideal. And I wonder uh, to what extent this study here uh, missed an opportunity in emphasizing that important role of religion. Uh, here, um, Sikh national, there's no role really for religion in this text. Religion as a critical perspective, which contrasts the, the transcendence with uh, any political formation, be it a Sikh formation, be it a Jain formation, um, is a very potent force. And uh, uh, that is another question I have for the authors. I'm sure they have a lot to say. I'm, as I said, quite ignorant about the whole matter. These are just some ideas. Thanks. Okay, Peter, thanks very much. If you could stop sharing your screen, that would be wonderful. Okay, so we've had two very different kinds of commentaries um, on the book. I think Gahapal, uh, it's only polite and proper now to give you an opportunity to respond, um, both to the praise, but also to the criticism. Okay, um, thank you um, to both Peter and Ian. Um, with um, reference to um, the points made by Ian, I, I think um, as we're mostly on the same wavelength um, and, and share a similar perspective, I, th I think there is not, perhaps, perhaps not much that I, need to address, um, except uh, a couple of points, um, uh, namely um, the issue of um, to what extent, uh, you know, is, is the Sikh case similar to other nation nationalisms of small peoples? Uh, that is referred to in the book. We, we refer to the Kashmiris, the Pashtuns, um, the Baluchis, Nagas, and the Tamils, they're not to the extent that perhaps uh, something like this uh, would have warranted in a comparative study. Um, on, on violence, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the points that you have made, um, I, I was reading um, the controversial book, um, The Last Days of the Raj, uh, written on Mountbatten's uh, Viceroyalty, a book which is very difficult to get hold of. Um, and in it, there's a phrase, you know, where, where um, um, Sikhs are framed as a, um, as, as a culprits of violence, but he comes out with a phrase which is very interesting um, and, and needs to be looked at for this year, is that the Sikhs were the scapegoats of partition violence. You know, that if you're looking at the ends and outcomes, um, that they they were, you know, in the words of Paul Brass, um, had, to un had to engage in retributive violence to 
achieve their goals on the ground, goals that could not be achieved through the um, partition plan. Um, I, I find your analysis of Pakistan's um, Sikh policy, both pre and 19, post-1947, very much in concurrence with my own thoughts uh, and, and the idea um, that, you know, Pakistan sees the Sikhs through the lens of religion, because to see them otherwise as an ethnic or um, a, a, a linguistic co-community um, would problematize the two nation theory. And in that sense, the, the, the work has um, um, it, it taken that on board. And it's in, in some ways is quite, you know, if, if it's read carefully, is quite critical of Pakistan's um, Sikh policy as, as it is both of Indi India's Sikh policy post 47. Um, and, and on your final point of the linkages with, the, with Punjab studies, um, I, I think, you know, again, I really don't have any differences between you and you insofar as um, Ilias Jetta's work and the recent re research shows how porous the post 47 um, Radcliffe line has been and that there are more continuities and discontinuities um, in, in um, um, the uh, post-47 history of Punjab. Um, and it's only perhaps with the creation of the electric border um, in the late 80s that uh, the, 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 the cross-border flows have ceased. Um, I, I think you're also write about highlighting the areas of um, potential areas of research uh, and the fact that there probably are more Sikhs in the Northwest frontier in Sindh uh, and in the Pashtun lands and there are in Punjab. And the reason for that is quite obvious because the, the partition ethnic cleansing was most systematic in Punjab um, and where people from have stayed on or are of Sikh origins in contemporary Punjab, Pakistan, um, they are often, you know, they often converted to Islam. So um, that, that, you know, th th that the point you made is, is, is very well taken. And, I'm, and I know that there, for example, there is research going on into Sikhs in Sindh. Okay, um, I'm moving on to um, Peter's um, contribution, which is um, excellent. And thank you, Peter, for taking so much time out and um, focusing on the work um, and, and um, you know, taking us to task in such a pleasant way. Um, I, I just um, respond in, in you know, again, to a couple of points, and, and I can't do justice to everything that you've said. Um, you, you say that we, you know, we, we don't really explore things uh, well in terms of the sociology that we claim that we do. Um, I, I, I beg to disagree a bit here. Um, I, I, you know, as you can probably see from the work and, and what has been done, um, there is a substantial background in working on diasporas and multiculturalism and uh, uh, working with likes of John Rex and Robin Cohen and others in, 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 in my own background, at least, uh, and, and previously the work on Sikhs in Britain. So, so that element is, is, is there as, and it's reflected in emphasis on modernization and the so social change, you know, occurring in post forty seven Punjab, but more recently, as as a as a result of the impact of uh, globalization in, in the last twenty years, and what's that doing to Punjabi and Sikh society? So, so that is taken on board, um, as and and also, I think. Um, um, the point about ethno-symbolism rather than ethno, 
um, ethnic states. Um, I think we, we need to separate here. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure when you were going on about ethno-nationalism um, in the same um, vein as when you were speaking about ethno-symbolism. And I don't think they're two, um, you know, they're not the same things. Ethno-symbolism is, is an approach to understanding the ethnic origins. Um, and uh, it should not be completed, conflated with ethno-nationalism. And um, as for your, 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 your comment about the vagueness of ethnicity and nationalism, and the um, slippage between the two terms. Um, that's a point that's well taken. And, and you know, it's often said um, that it's not easy to know where an ethnic group ends and a nation begins. Um, but, you know, and, and, and of course, in some situations, that distinction is irrelevant because it, you know, ethnic groups are burning. But nonetheless, it, I, I think the primary distinction is one of the consciousness of being a nation. And you can have plenty of ethnic groups, which, which by objective definition um, are um, ethnic groups or could be identified as ethnic groups, but they do not have the subjective consciousness of being a nation. Um, moving on to your um, other really interesting two points, um, and, and I must say I'm not familiar with uh, Louis de Mont's uh, essay um, that you refer to, um, and the reference that we give to him in the volume uh, is on caste, uh, and not to the essay I think that you mentioned. Um, it, it's an interesting point um, is, is to what extent um, nationalism um, has changed or defined the religion and, and, and to what extent that pursuit of individualism then reconstructs religion. If I could use an analogy, one, one could say that Hindu nationalism today is redefining what it is to be a, a Hindu, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a political sense, to be part of a political community. Um, and, and that um, debate or, or, or a juncture um, has not or was not reached with the, with, with the rise of Sikh nationalism, partly because it's, it's incomplete. It's incomplete because there has not been a, a, an end point to state formation, or at least a, some kind of accommodation with a separate state or notion of a state. And nationalism per se, as we, we see in stateless national communities, means a lot of things, remains uh, often um, um, nascent, um, um, not reaching a significant level of development. And you can contrast this with, for example, Pakistan um, and, and the Muslim League's success in creating a separate state. There are the tensions between religion, state, and nationalism, and nationalism as a, almost a, um, um, a, 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 as, as a non-religious phenomena are very acute. And they're being played out in Pakistan and, and in Pakistan politics since 1947. Um, so it, for, for a minority community like the Sikhs, um, the, the problems that you allude to are much more acute because one, they, um, the Sikhs themselves are so uh, divided among themselves that the emergence of some kind of civil society um, that is non-religious or idealistically uh, contra-ritualized religion has not emerged or has not emerged in the same format. Um, 
and and so you know I, I think that 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 is a very interesting point of departure and one to debate for the future. Um, one two other points that I want to discuss and mention. Um, communalism and nationalism as a distinction. Um, in chapter three on the emergence of Sikh nationalism, I, which I wrote, I go into great detail about this. Um, and, and it's a communalism, you know, again, is not a sort of lower level of uh, 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 medieval phenomenon posited against um, secular nationalism um, um, as a Congress and Nehru and others argued, not only against the Sikhs, but also against the Muslim League. Um, so the Pakistan movement right up until partition and the transfer of power was essentially communal, communalist, medievalist, and, and um, against a, a, the secular vision. Um, but the communal um, phenomenon, I, I think, it, it, you know, th th this is, um, you know, this is a real problem for thinking about nationalism in India beyond um, the, the, the ideal of the Indian Congress. How do you accommodate the aspirations and feelings and, of others who define their identities and political visions through the religious idiom? Um, and the only answer that... Um, um, Indian academics and the Congress have come up with largely it, it is to relegate it to the realm of uh, communalism, and um, and I think that doesn't help us at all in in an in an age when we see religion and religious nationalism in a different light, especially since post 9/11, and and the Iranian Revolution. I, I find your. Um, Con, um, the contrast between the Jains and the Sikhs um, interesting, uh, but then the Jains have not, as you say, have not been territorialized or have a territory which they can co call a homeland. And without a territory, there's no nationalism, um, at least um, in, 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 the, in the 20th century. Um, so, the, so you might find it, um, you know that the, comparing the Sikhs in the diaspora to the uh, Jains um, is not like for like. It, it's a different context, and uh, and it's also is a different historical experience. Um, and this this also relates to you know what what you conflate as a legal text. Um, and a sociological concept, i.e., you know, the reference in the work to um, uh, the famous Mandala versus um, Lee judgment, um, which um, in, in the House of Lords in 1983, um, or which declared the Sikhs as a nation and, and brought them in within the purview of the Race Relations Act. Um, my point was basically in writing that and, and uh, um, in, in posing it in that way was to highlight the, the competing narratives of Sikh identity. Um, it wasn't to lord the, sorry to use a pun, the House of Lords um, to the skies, you know, that they, that was an affirmation of Sikh identity. It was just simply to illustrate how, you know, if you read the text, it says it brought, you know, that, that, um, court decision brought competing narratives of Sikh identity to a head. Um, and maybe perhaps if the Jains had organized like the Sikhs and, um, and, and campaigned, um, they themselves, um, you know, like the Jews and the Sikhs could have become within the purview of the Race Relations Act. Um, but overall, um, I must say, um, I found your, um, um, comments very um, um, challenging and refreshing, and and I agree entirely with you that um, you know um, ethnicity and, and nationalism are very difficult concepts, and uh, and I, and I must confess of all the books that I've written, um, this was the hardest to do because nationalism was something that you you sensed and felt, but you could never quantify. So in, in you know, as 
in, in political science, you really often want to put numbers to things and you really, really struggled with this. So thanks you very much for that. Well, Harpal, that was a fantastic off the cuff response to two um, complex and mm -hmm. dense responses to your book. And I think along the way, you managed to comment very well on Dumont's 1964 article. Um, if Peter will smile now, that would be fantastic as well. So I, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but I would like to kick off as, as chair, asking you one directly. Um, and if I could just take the conversation slightly outside the, the Sikh Punjab studies question, ask you about the broader political science context in which this book is written. Um, Giorgio Shani, who I hope is still with us in the background, has written about um, the global world. And you mentioned in your, your comments about a post-sovereign future. Uh, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about that broader political science framework where you were imagining a future and how you saw that political future play out, particularly in reference to Sikh nationalism, which then becomes a post-sovereign form of polity. Uh, is Giorgio there? Uh, yeah, I, I'm here okay. physically. I'm not sure uh, mentally. Uh, should I respond? Uh, can, can I just respond first? Yes. And, and, and then you Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Edward, the, the, there is a political science dimension to this. Um, and that is um, that my own work, um, diff slightly different from Giorgio's, uh, has been within the um, context of ethnic conflict, comparative ethnic conflict regulation. And, the, and in that work, the, the development of um, U European Union uh, has been quite important, um, or the emergence of U European Union which is sympathetic to um, nations without a state has been very, very important. So in, 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 in that broader context, drawing on the works of um, Michael Keating and others, um, I have argued um, that states like um, Catalonia, Scotland, um, uh, the Bas, uh, the um, sorry, the, the, the Welsh and others, that they, they, they can perhaps, um, they have claims to, um, um, claims which can be satisfied within a broader context, the post-sovereign future, um, in, in which certain rights um, are um, recognised, and, and also in contexts where, for example, like Northern Ireland and Belgium and, and elsewhere, where they're competing claims to sovereignty. Now, potentially, comparatively, this kind of thing could emerge in South Asia, as you know, others have discussed and as Ian has written about in the past, and power sharing agreed agreements within um, provinces pre-1947 were the norm under colonialism. Um, Post-colonial, we have gone to a majoritarian, um, religiously hegemonic states. And now if the borders uh, were more porous, if the states were more enlightened, power sharing agreements or sovereignty sharing agreements are not um, impossible to Im think through um, in, in um, highly, um, uh, conflict ridden regions and um, you know so so in the Sikh case um i have written elsewhere um uh, in an article on the katarpur corridor that the opening of the katarpur corridor um to coincide with the um 30th anniversary of the collapse of the berlin wall was a point for reimagining a punjab or, or a relationship for the Sikh community other ways, if the politics of the Indian state and Pakistan were different. 
Um, I mean, one of the most telling phrases that was used by um, uh, when the um, Kartarpur, on the day the Kartarpur corridor was opened, and you know I lectured at SOAS on it, was when, when they asked the head of the Sikh religious organization, the, uh, of the Sikh clergy to say what it meant for the Sikhs. And his first and his only main word, um, key word was that we are glad that the gates um, that have locked us in for the last um, 70 years or so have been opened. So, so I think there's a huge potential for reimagining. Um, but but th that also, you know, like the Soviet Union and, and today's Russia sits with everyday reality. So, Georgia. Um, thank you. I, I believe the question was um, about the relationship between this work and uh, trends within political science, or uh, Edward, if you could remind me of, of the question. Yes, of course. Um, I'm sorry to keep you awake as well. The, the question was really about your, your previous work on the, the state of the globe. And Gaharpal had mentioned how um, Sikh ethno-nationalism was sort of well suited for a post-sovereign world. So I, I wondered the, the future, was wondering about the future framework um, that you'd imagined for the world in this book, because you're clearly looking to a future in some of the conclusions. I just wondered what that future world was. Uh, well, I, I hope it still will be a future world if the world has a future. Um, the, the, the point I was trying to make in my earlier work was about the embodied nature of Sikh sovereignty. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, rooted in the external symbols of the Khalsa and in the concept of the Guru Panth, uh, the notion that uh, the Panth itself, the, the Khalsa itself, the community of believers is a sovereign body. Um, this does not necessarily have a territorial dimension. Um, and certainly, uh, if we look at transformations within the global economy, uh, which um, before COVID, um, we uh, live in a world in which uh, the basic economic unit or actor is not the nation state, uh, or certainly was moving away from the nation state. Now, if the state no longer has an economic component to it and an economic function, then this radically alters the relationship between nation and state. So uh, we can think not only within the context of the European Union uh, of um, a uh, disassociation between ideas of nations and the ideas of states. Uh, so the territorial dimension here is challenged. Now, unfortunately, what we've seen, particularly after COVID-19, uh, has been uh, a, a form of globalization, which can be termed disembodied globalization, uh, in which it's not people who are traveling. Um, we're being localized. We're being more territorialized. We're uh, uh, communicating via Zoom and other um, tools in a way of, of global capitalism. So here um, we, we have a, a re-emphasizing of the importance of the territorial dimension of, uh, of sovereignty. I think states, particularly in liberal democratic societies within the EU have, uh, I wouldn't say taken advantage of the crisis uh, of COVID, but have certainly uh, implemented states of, of emergency uh, and states of exception, um, which have uh, placed restrictions on movements of people, uh, you know, for, for good reasons. Uh, we will call this securitization. Um, and I, I think the direction uh, is, is going more towards uh, a greater territorialization here 
uh, of identity, and that may be linked with changes within uh, the wider global co economy. But I think the key point, which we also make within the book, is about Sikh nationalism being a reactive phenomenon. So in this sense, the Sikhs adapt themselves to the world around them. And um, uh, nationalism, particularly the idea, the centrality of the state, um, was an anathema to, as, as we, we look at within the book, to um, Sikh elites at the time of, of partition. In a way, the territorialization was forced upon them through partition. Um, and um, uh, also by the events of 1984. So it's a reactive phenomenon. Uh, in this sense, um, uh, changes within international relations, within global economy, also impacts on Sikh identity. Great, thank you very much. That was a fantastic answer. Um, so we have two questions in, in the chat. I'm, I'm sure you've seen them both. The first one uh, from Arushi Kapoor is about um, Hindu Punjabi identity and how that fits within the diaspora and nationalism narrative, uh, living with a, a double ethnic identity, as they put it, particularly the people who migrated from Pakistan during partition who are no longer residents of Punjab, but still label themselves as Punjabis. It's slightly outside the scope of the book, but I think the comparative reflection here um, is, is worthwhile exploring just for a minute. Gahapo. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I think in a way, um, you know, the same kind of issues um, apply. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm having trouble um, having a look at the question. Thank you. Would you like me to read it to you? Yeah, no, I got, I've got it now, in Jones. Yeah, I, I think in, 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 in the Punjabi Hindu context, um, the, the, the same, what one, one can assume, you know, the kind of things we talk about in the volume uh, on the diaspora, that same kind of issues apply of um, uh, of, of a distant homeland um, of of attachment to to a land and, and an overseas identity. Um, however, there is one difference, one substantial difference, um, when compared to the Sikhs, um, because the the the, the nationalism. Um, um, of Punjabi Nas or Punjabiyat um, is is one that that is not exceptionally or you know sense of regionalist regionalism is is one that is not exceptionally strong amongst Punjabi Hindus um, in Punjab historically. Um, it has been much more. Um, prevalent, and Ian can correct me on this, but a much more um, um, vibrant and res uh, resilient amongst uh, Muslims and, and Sikhs, and less so amongst, uh, perhaps, um, amongst Punjabi Hindus, um, largely because of the nature of Punjab's agrarian rural um, structure during colonial rule. Now, you know, post-1947, that, that has shifted somewhat um, with the creation uh, of India and Pakistan and the division of the partition. So um, I, I, I'm not um, quite, you know, I, I don't really understand the question, but I, I guess, you know, I'm just point, giving pointers, but I, th I think there are some similarities um, with, with the Sikh issue. But I, I would point the, que the person asking the question to the literature on the Hindu diaspora, um, of which there's an extensive amount, um, especially in um, USA, and, and how the diaspora studies position um, people's identities vis-a-vis -vis the homeland. 
Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Yes. And the, the final question in the chat is from Alec Daliwal, which, excuse me if I paraphrase it, and that's the role of gender uh, in thinking through nationalism. Um, and, and the question really, really, it's a really interesting one, about how gender fits in to an ethno-religious framework. So I'll just leave the question at that for you to respond to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a very good question and, and one that, um, you know, um, when we first sent out the draft, the reviewers pulled us up. And, and then if, if you read the book, and, and, I, and I'm sure Ian, um, 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 Peter and yourself have had a quick look, we spend a great deal of time discussing gender uh, and, and how the, the, you know, how gender issues are dealt with in the construction of Sikh nationalism and how gender then undermines homogeneity and the construction of the Sikh national nation as an ideal and how gender is central to identity formation in the late 19th century and, and themes of violence. So it's, it's recognized as, a, as, as both a theme in the work uh, and as a structural division. Um, importantly, and, and I think this, this is you know, where it then comes down to something um, that is operational, um, um, we do not acknowledge gender as a political division, political division that influenced decision making and the narrative of history um, in, in the history that we've written. Now, that, that is not to say um, that this um, dimension cannot be explored. Um, the challenge, I think, going forward, and this book is laying out the template, is that we hope scholars will come along, feminist scholars will come along and say, look, you know, we, we want to write, we are going to write about this and here's the evidence. So I, th I think we, we've addressed the gender issue in the work in the best way I think we can with our limitations uh, and outline the ways existing scholars have done it. And as Peter said, we've reviewed the existing literature and we and, and, and now I think what we've done is we pose the challenge to future scholars to say go out and do it and demonstrate um, the the importance of this dimension and move away from kind of a priori theorizing saying this is this is needs to be integrated. I think you cannot uh, write on anything now without taking this dimension and many other dimensions, incorporating them into your work seriously. Uh, if I could just add on that point, um, I think if we go back to the narratives of, of Sikh identity, um, then uh, compared to uh, many other uh, South Asian religions, uh, Sikhism is egalitarian. Um, and indeed, there has been um, feminist literature, um, particularly um, uh, Nikki Gunanda Singh Kaur's work on the feminine principle um, it, within Sikhism. Um, and on the other hand, um, you have nationalism per se as a very patriarchal concept. So I think this is the contradiction which, which we are working within. Um, this is not, when, we, when I put, uh, speak in terms of nationalism being a patriarchal concept, I'm not confining it just to the Sikhs. Uh, we can talk about any forms of nationalism. Um, so uh, I think, um, you know, this, this work has to negotiate um, or work within this, this contradiction within the literature. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to say um, that this is a work of synthesis. You know, it, it brings together uh, competing perspectives. And it has an underlying thesis, you know, it has a strong argument, but at the same time, you know, as Peter said, it, it's an attempt to 
say that we are not unconscious of other perspectives, in fact, to engage openly with other perspectives. And for, for a short, you know, 100,000 words, um, it, it, it's obviously a, a great limitation that one cannot write on a, a particular theme uh, at length. I mean, I could have written a whole book on the partition on, a, on the basis of what I'm doing, um, but it was keeping a sense of proportion. So again, you know, my plea would be that it, the, the work signposts, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, areas for further research, for further understanding and engaging um, more critically. And in fact, critically with, you know, coming back to us and say, here's where you're wrong. And this is plainly wrong and mistaken. And, and that would be, we would sense that's a wonderful achievement. What a fantastic sentiment. And Ian did point to some of the areas for future research in his comments. And maybe we could go back to Ian in a moment. But before we do, there's the final question from Salman Rafi, which I, I thought, Rahapal, you in part addressed before, but he's asked it again. So I, I feel duty bound to acknowledge the question and put it to you. And that is about how Sikh nationalism relates to other minority nationalisms in South Asia. And the examples chosen in the question are Baluch nationalism in Pakistan and Tamil nationalism in Sri Lanka. It's a comparative question on which I'm sure you can yeah. talk for a very long time, but I would ask you to be brief. Okay, um, I, I, I will only, only say that, you know, this is a, uh, you know, this is the hot topic. I mean, I, I think this is the alternative way of looking at 1947. Um, in an age, you know, if we're reflecting on uh, the partition 75 years on, um, we also must reflect on, on you know, on old alternative futures of what could have been, um, what might have been had the tr transfer of power been to, um, not only been to India and Pakistan, but to um, the princely states as well, uh, as well as um, India and Pakistan, or what what constituted India Pakistan at the time. And and you know, reading the literature on partition at the moment, I, I am struck by one fact, and, and that fact is how desperate Nehru, Patel, Gandhi, on the one hand. Jinnah and his team on the other were desperate, how desperate they were to acquire state power. And, and that state power, I, th I think, was important in making the post-1947 nations, um, as well as nation state, as, uh, sorry, as well as states. So the, the Sikh nationalism relates to these other nationalisms as, as, as comparable sub-regional or regional movements that had potential um, for an alternative future of the subcontinent. But the requirements of British state policy and conditions on the ground um, meant that the, the only solution that was uh, preferable to the Attlee government was one that held most of the South, sub, uh, of the subcontinent together. And that was only by partition of India and Pakistan. So these nationalisms have a lot in common um, and they, have, they, they can comparatively learn a lot from each other. Uh, and, uh, um, I would urge you to read the book and learn the lessons. Thank you very much. I think the, the role of the, the partition, as you put it there, is really important in, in developing a sophisticated answer to that question, as, as you just laid out. OK, so I am keen to let Gahapal and Georgia have the last word, but I'm also keen to hear again from Ian and Peter uh, about their reflections as, as held on to how the discussion has unfolded. So Ian first and then Peter, if I may. Yes, I mean, I, I, what has interested me obviously is the partition aspect. And I know that uh, this is uh, gonna form a separate publication that uh, Gahapal is working on. But um, 
that last point mm. about um, state power, you know, and, and the convergence, the British want uh, as far as possible for their strategic imperial interests, uh, a strong subcontinent. They don't want balkanization. That's certainly, um, if, if you go back to the episode where um, Mountbatten on a hunch showed an early draft of the partition plan mm -hmm. to Nehru, and Nehru was appalled uh, when he saw this because of the threat of balkanization. And, it, and in a way, of course, um, it, it was to prevent balkanization, the transfer of power took the form it did because it served the British interest, it served Congress interest because there was this sense of having a strong India in the world, but also uh, I think of using the power of the state to modernize India. If you had too many statelets, that was gonna get in the way of the modernization um, program, which really Nehru was very much attached to. Uh, and uh, there's this convergence then, which squeezes out alternative possibilities and arrangements which would dilute the power of, of, of a, an all India state and would, would get in the way perhaps of the, the vision uh, of uh, what would replace British rule. Uh, so that Nehru's vision of what will replace British rule doesn't have a place for minor uh, subnational groupings, just as the British vision is not of uh, conceding power in India and, and throwing the towel in with empire generally, but of still trying to maintain in an alternative architecture, some of the advantages of former direct rule uh, in India. And, and that is the uh, necessity then for a strong state, for some kind of military um, use perhaps still of uh, India for the British empire more generally and not being seen to uh, be a, a waning power, but of rearranging things uh, in order to have virtually the same kind of advantages, material advantages uh, following uh, independence. So I think those are areas which, uh, you know, this volume and, and subsequent work really, um, to my mind, uh, can reflect on. You know, and this is where I think particularly with the 75th anniversary, but also perhaps with rethinking um, more generally um, what um, Britain's role in the world was seen to be after the Second World War. Uh, that, that I think is an important way forward. Thank you very much. That was really thought provoking. Peter, could I ask you for a final brief reflection, please? I, I learned a lot from Ian. I didn't know that Pashtuns uh, were uh, so, uh, had such a strong Sikh uh, community. I mean, there's the assumption uh, well developed in the book, which has useful tables about the social structure within the Sikh community, that uh, all Sikhs are Jats and all Jats uh, are Sikhs in a particular region. And uh, uh, the story of the conversion of the Jats and generally of conversion, I find very interesting, taking again the perspective of uh, a scholar of religion, if you like. Uh, um, the uh, argument made in the, in the book uh, about the diaspora was that the, the Sikhs uh, are a world religion and in the index, in brackets, it says, I think only in the index, British concept, British colonial <laughs> concept. <laughs> but otherwise, it is positively formulated. Sikhs are world religion. What does it mean? And then it is said, well, there are many um, non jats or non people from uh, non uh, Indic families that have converted just to demonstrate that we have a kind of uh, a potentially totalizing um, faith that is able to integrate all humanity. In Weberian terms, of course, the world religion is a religion that has many, many followers. It's quantitatively uh, determined and therefore uh, 26 million are not negligible, but um, I think it is 
a little bit. Um, um, yeah, I wonder what that is. And um, the other thing uh, which I forgot to mention is, of course, that the book, this is for the people who have not read it, uh, is take, placing itself also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our former colleague, Arind Mandir, uh, his, whose critical theory is, is taking as a kind of uh, a straw man, uh, some kind of uh, a useful sparring partner. That, um, and uh, he said, uh, this position is not taking into account uh, pre-colonial um, developments and so on. And uh, um, I understand that uh, Georgiou is taking a more nuanced position. <laughs> that is quite clear. Um, but uh, it's interesting how uh, the book positions itself. Um, but again, uh, I, I wasn't quite uh, convinced by the answer, my last remark by uh, Guharpal, um, about the communalist question. I mean, is it's basically reduced in the passages in the book, which extensively deal with this issue. In the index, the term communalism doesn't figure. Um, as, a, as a political label used by the Congress for political uh, you know, anti-Sikh purposes, at least as far as the Punjab is concerned. But uh, it is also, I mean, it's a strange, um, of course, uh, ambiguity. Uh, um, it's also used as an analytical term by people such as uh, Dumont and others. And uh, I think more, getting more clarity um, on this may help uh, because if the question of a Sikh state is now put to rest for the time being and the global dimension of the diaspora community or the global Sikh community is coming into view, um, then the issue of communalism um, rather than nationalism in, in a narrow sense is focused on a, building a state may be more appropriate. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for fantastic provocations now. I think if we can leave the question of world religion, straw men and communalism as open and begging until next time we meet, that would be fantastic. And we give opportunity for the Harpal and Giorgio to spend 30 seconds explaining to us why we should read the book. Then I think we could bring this event to a close. Um, Guharpal, would you like to go first or Giorgio? Yeah, um, Giorgio first, then, then I'll sum up. Yeah. Uh, it would be better if you could go first, since it's 4 a.m. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I, I would say to everybody, and, and to Peter um, especially, is, is reread the book if you haven't read it, or if you read it only once. And uh, especially reread chapter three, because I do deal with communalism at length, and read chapter, Giorgio's chapter one where we talk about religious nationalism and relationship with communalism to some extent. Um, essentially, the work is very readable. And, uh, I, you know, as others have said, it, it's difficult to plug your own work. I, I, I think I, I would leave it to the judgment of the reader. I'm, and, and I thank everybody for, you know, being so actively engaged in the discussion. Well, thank you. Georgia? Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody, um, uh, Edward, Ian, uh, and Peter, for uh, their questions and their comments. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a culmination of, of, of our work. Gaharpal has been working on this for 40 years. I've been working on it for only 25. Um, please read the book if you're interested in nationalism or if you're interested in in uh, nationalisms within South Asia, or if you're interested in, in Sikhs or Sikhism, uh, I do think that um, we um, do touch on issues uh, which are of contemporary relevance today. Uh, unfortunately, we can't um, ignore nationalism uh, nor its relationship with religion.
Thank you very much. Well, so that brings a very fulsome, uh, erudite and wide ranging conversation to a close. Um, the clock does that rather than anything else. I would like to thank our discussants, Peter and Ian, for participating so fantastically with these debates. But more importantly, I'd like to thank Gaharpal and Giorgio for writing the book, um, for bringing these issues into our broader consciousness. But also, I really appreciate the spirit of collaboration that goes into such an ambitious co-authored book. I'm sure it wasn't all smooth sailing, and those things never are, but the the combined effect of your work and your different perspectives have really shone through in this discussion for me. So you're both to be congratulated for that. Um, and for those of you who are still in the audience, the book was published by Cambridge University Press, uh, and it's called Sikh Nationalism from a Dominant Minority to an Ethno-Religious Diaspora, published with a publication date of 2021. Um, finally, I'd just like to thank my colleague Sunil, who has organised this event and is, is sat patiently and quietly in the background. So on behalf of us all and the South Asia Institute, Sunil, thank you very much. Um, right, and with that, I will close the, the book launch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, Peter. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.